So far, in this chapter, we've defined vector fields and we've looked at line integrals of vector fields. Um, when we define vector fields, one of the ways that we had of producing a vector field was to take a real valued function of many variables and take the gradient vector of that function everywhere, or everywhere the function was defined, or everywhere the gradient vector is defined. Um, and that, that gave us a way of producing a vector field from a real valued function, and we gave a name to the kind of vector field you produce by taking the gradient vector field. We also called it a conservative vector field. In the line integral section, we looked at in, well, taking line integrals of vector fields, and our primary application of that was if you've got a force field and you calculate the line integral um, where all your coordinates are measuring distances or positions, then it's, um, it tells you how much work the vector field does on the object as it moves along a, well, along a path, a piecewise regular curve, an oriented piecewise regular curve. Um, in this section, which is entitled conservative vector fields, we're going to look at conservative vector fields more carefully and see what and our, one of the fundamental theorems, the fundamental theorem of conservative vector fields, tells us what the relationship is between a conservative vector field and line integrals. So let's suppose you have F. Suppose we have a real a real valued function F defined on uh, a real value differentiable function f, a real value differentiable function f defined on an open subset U of Rn such that, well, we want the gradient vector field. So it's differentiable, certainly all its partial derivatives exist, such that the gradient vector field is continuous. So we could assume that little f is continuously differentiable. This is a weaker condition, but it's all that we need is continuous. Um, all right, suppose you have this. So we produce a vector field by taking the gradient vector of some function at each point. Now what I want to do is I want to look at a line integral. I want to look at a line integral from some point A to some point B, so all of this is inside U. So suppose, suppose I've got a point A in U and a point B in U, and I take some oriented curve, piecewise regular oriented curve, that lies, that lies inside U and goes from A to B. What I'd like to look at so it's piecewise regular, so we'll parameterize it by, so parameterized by say, R of T, well R, and R will be on a closed interval, or will be defined on a closed interval where at time T, well I think of this as time, at t naught, you're at the point A, and at t1, you're at the point B. Okay, so the question is, what do you get? So we want to look at this. What can you say about the line integral? Well, first I want to re recall the chain rule. So recall the chain rule.
suppose we take the derivative with respect to t of f composed with, with little f composed with r of t. The chain rule tells us this is the gradient vector of f, or the gradient of f, evaluated at r of t, dotted with, that's the dot product, dotted with r prime of t. That's the chain rule. We've known that for a long time. Well, then what does this tell us about the line integral? Well, everything. So um, what we just what we just wrote is understand we have our vector field is produced by the gradient of f. And we just said that the derivative with respect to t of f of r of t is the gradient of f at r of t dotted with r prime of t. But the gradient vector of f is what's giving us our vector field f. This is f evaluated at r of t dotted with r prime of t. And hopefully now you see the relationship between this and the line integral. This line integral, by definition, is calculated by, you would integrate from t naught to t1, f evaluated at r of t dotted with r prime of t dt. But this is the derivative of f of r of t. And you integrate with respect to t. What you produce then, so now from, from, calc, from one variable calculus, you're integrating the derivative of this with respect to t. All you get is f of r of t evaluated between t naught and t1. That's f of r at t1 minus f of r at t naught, but r at t1 is the final point on our curve, b, and r at t naught is our initial point, a. This is f of b minus f of a. <laughs> All right, this is what we were after. What this says is if you want to calculate, if you have a vector field that's produced by taking the gradient vector of a function, then line integrals of that vector field are just can be calculated from a point A to a point B, can be calculated just by taking the function that, whose gradient gives you the vector field by evaluating that function at the final point and subtracting the value at the initial point. This, that doesn't use what's, one of the things that's important about that, or the thing, is that this is independent of the curve. This doesn't use, this doesn't refer to r of t at all. f, little f is related to the vector field f. It produces it for us when we take the gradient, and then you have the points a and b. But the curve that we actually integrated along c has vanished, and its parameterization, r of t, has vanished. It means that for a conservative vector field, so a vector field that's the gradient vector field of a given function, the line integral is independent of the path. It just depends on the vector field and on the initial point and the final point, but not on the actual path that you take from the initial point to the final point. This is called, this result that we've just proved is called the fundamental theorem of line integrals. And you could say, it's the fundamental theorem of line integrals and conservative vector fields. This is the fundamental theorem of line integrals. And so I, let me state it again. For, I, I should say very carefully that most vector fields are not the gradients, the gradient vector fields of anything. So this doesn't tell you how to calculate line integrals of all vector fields. It's if. F is the gradient vector field of F, and 
see is, a, is an oriented piecewise regular curve. A to B, then the line integral of F along C is F of B minus F of A. Right? I was just writing what we just derived. Um, I'll say again, um, you need little f to be differentiable and you need for the gradient vector, so the vector field itself, to be continuous. But um, this is the big result. It's for very special kinds of vector fields, ones that are produced by gradients. But it tells you for those, line integrals are independent of the path you pick. It, uh, it depends on the initial point and the final point, but not on the particular path itself. Um, one special case of this, so in particular, If C is a closed curve, so C comes back to itself, well, then it's your initial point, your final point are the same. In particular, then line integral around C of f dot dr is zero. So for conservative vector fields, the line integral around closed curves is always zero. Um, in fact, uh, it takes some work to show it, but these conditions that line integrals are independent of the path or that line integrals around closed curves equals zero, those conditions are equivalent to saying capital F is the gradient vector field of some little f. Um, so that capital F is conservative if and only if, well, by definition, if it's the gradient vector field of some little f, um, or, but that you can, you can prove that that's true if and only if line integrals are independent of the paths between the final point and initial point, and you can prove that's equivalent to line integrals around closed curves are always zero. So those are all equivalent, but our definition of a conservative vector field is that there is an f, a little f, whose gradient vector field is big F. I want, I want to write that carefully. I know we, uh, earlier, in the first section of the chapter, we define conservative vector field, and I've said it a couple of times now. But there, it was more of we started with a little f. And we said, oh, and a way to get a good vector field is to take um, the gradient vector field of that little f. The emphasis here is, is slightly different. It may sound like a trivial difference to you, but we're starting with a vector field f, the capital F, and we want to say it's conservative if there exists a little f. So the emphasis here is on you start with the f and then you want to know if there's a little f. So um, the definition of continuous vector field. subset of Rn, an open subset U of Rn is conservative if and only if this is the definition. There exists A differentiable f, real valued f on u, 
such that your vector field is the gradient vector field of f. Right, I just wanted to state that again kind of with the emphasis change from how we defined it before. Um, let's look at an example with a specific function. So there's a function I want here. It's actually one we looked at before, but it was disguised. So So let's look at f of xyz equals xyz plus e to the x plus sine of y plus the inverse tangent of z. All right. I want to take, <laughs> let's try this again. I want to take the gradient vector field of this, so that by definition will be a conservative vector field, and then I want to look at line integrals. So let's define f to be the gradient vector field of this little f. So the partial derivative with respect to x is yz plus e to the x. The partial derivative with respect to y is xz plus the cosine of y. And the partial derivative with respect to z is xy plus 1 over 1 plus z squared. I don't know if you recognize this or not, but we did look at this vector field in the last section. And what we did with it, I didn't tell you it was a gradient vector field, but what we did with it was we had the point 1, 0, 0. We had the point 1, 0, 0 and the point 0, 0, 1. And we looked at the line integral of this vector field along two different paths. One path, so one oriented curve, piecewise regular oriented curve, we went in along the x-axis and then up the z-axis. And in the other path, we went in a semicircle in the, in the xz plane. We went along here. And what we found was that the line integrals along those two paths were the same. Now that's not true for all vector fields, that the line integrals along two different paths that start at the same place and end at the same place are the same. But it's true for conservative vector fields. Um, and so we now know this is a conservative vector field, right? Because it's, by definition, it's the gradient vector field of this. So it's a conservative vector field. That's the definition that there exists a little f. So that capital F is the gradient vector field of little f. So um, we know that regardless of what path, what oriented piecewise regular path you take from, from this point to this point, no matter which one you pick, it does, could be anything, the line integral along C of f dotted with dr is just your, your function f um, evaluated at the final point minus your function f evaluated at the initial point. So now you plug in 0, 0, 1 for x, y, and z. Uh, so you get 0. Um, you get e to the 0, so you get 1. Uh, sine of 0. So that's 0. And then you're plugging in z is 0, the inverse tangent of 1, so plus pi over 4. And then you subtract what you get at 1, 0, 0, which is 0 
um, plus e um, plus e plus zero plus zero. So I'm getting one plus pi over four minus e. Notice. Notice how quick that is <laughs> if you start with the function little f and then, and then produce the vector field. Um, in the problems that we had before, we had the vector field. and We just had to calculate the line integrals. We would have the problem of producing such a little f. Before I go into that more carefully, I'd like to do another example, but it would help us to have a definition or call such a little f something. So, I will. Um, if and only if, so, it's not helpful to give a name to such little f's. Um, such an f is called a potential function. For the vector field. All right, so yeah, what I was saying a minute ago is if, if we start with little f, we can take its gradient vector field to get a conservative vector field, and then line integrals are easy. If you just start with a vector field, you, how do you know that it's conservative? This is a problem we want to look at. And if you know that it's conservative, how do you produce a potential function? A function, a little, a function little f, whose gradient vector field is your vector field big F. Um, these are problems. Before I address that, I should talk about how many different potential functions you could have. Like over here, we had, we had this function. And it's a potential function for this vector field. Are there other potential functions for this vector field? Well, we have to, you can go back to a theorem we had a long time ago, which said that if all of the partial derivatives of one function equal all of the partial derivatives of another function on a connected open set, then the two functions differ by a constant on the open set. So, um, in general, that means if you found one potential function, at least if, if you're open set, that everything is, you're dealing with is connected. If you found one potential function, you found them all. All the potential functions differ from your, your one that you produced by a constant. So let me write that. But if u is connected, so in one piece, if u is connected, all potential functions for a given f, for a given capital F, differ by a constant. You should think of it as producing, in, in single variable calculus, of producing an antiderivative. Once you know one, you know them all. It's one whatever antiderivative, whatever specific one you produce, plus an arbitrary constant. Same thing here. Once you've found a potential function, um, all of them look like that one plus an arbitrary constant if you're on a connected set. All right. Um, I want to look at another example where we will start with a vector field and produce a potential function, but it will be really easy. So it's kind of, kind of cheating, but it's really a warm up. So, suppose, here's another example. Suppose x and y are in meters.
And we have a force field defined everywhere on R2 given by 3x squared comma 2y newtons. So, so x and y are in meters. Um, we've got this force field in all of space. And now the question is, so let me draw a picture. I want to calculate how much work is done by F on an object which moves along, I'm going to write C equals C1 plus C2 plus C3, but I have to tell you what C1, C2, and C3 are, and I want to draw that in the picture. So here's 2, 0, the point 2, 0. Um, I want to C1 to go up to the point, so here's C1, it goes up to the point 2, 3, C2, so along a straight line, a line segment, C2 is the oriented line segment that goes from 2, 3 to 0, 3, and then I want to go along part of the circle of radius 3 centered at the origin. So I want C3 to go from here to here to go from 0, 3 to negative 3, 0. And I want to find the work done by F um, on an object as it moves along this curve. <laughs> it's, it's one of these fun things that we like to ask in multivariable calculus and you should kind of suspect, if you see a problem like this, you should suspect what's going on. This is kind of an annoying curve. And it's defined in three pieces. If we were in um, the last section, in section 4.2, what we would have done was we parameterize each of these curves separately, and you calculate the line integrals by definition. So by using the definition of the line integral and using the parameterizations. However, <laughs> If you're given an ugly enough curve, <laughs> it's a judgment call, what's ugly, but you should hope that your vector field is conservative and the ugly curve that you've been given doesn't matter. That you'll use the fundamental theorem of line integrals to calculate this line integral and not, and not use the definition. By the way, I haven't said this, of course, I should have said this, or reminded you, the work done is exactly what the line integral gives you. So we need to calculate the line integral along C of f dot dr. This is what we want. That is the work done. But we don't want to do it by definition and parameterize the three curves. We want to apply the fundamental theorem of line integrals. But to do that, we need to know that this is a conservative vector field and produce a potential function. So we have like two questions. A, is there an F so that our vector field is the gradient vector field of F? And B, if there is, we need to find one. If so, find one. Doesn't matter which one we pick, and we're going to subtract the value of little f at one point from the other. So if the two potential functions differ by a constant, that constant will disappear. Um, OK, is there such a little f? And if so, how do we find one? In fact, we'll do that at the same time. And this is an easy vector field that, for us to warm up with. So.
we want f equals the gradient vector field of little f. That's the vector of partial derivatives. But our vector field f is 3x squared, comma 2y. Now understand, in general, if we put an arbitrary vector field here, it may not be a conservative vector field. There may not be such a little f. But this time, we need, or want, <laughs> a partial derivative of f with respect to x equals 3x squared. And the partial derivative of f with respect to y equals 2y. And to produce a potential function, we need to be able to solve both of those simultaneously. But this isn't hard. This is an easy function. And f that does this is f equals x cubed. But then you could have plus any arbitrary function of y. And its partial derivative with respect to x would still be this, would still be 3x squared. But we want to produce this, so the y part needs to be y squared. So um, it's easy to see that you need f is x cubed plus y squared. Um, or we could add a, an arbitrary constant if we want. I shouldn't call it c because our curve is called c. But you could have any constant. This is what a potential function looks like. Every potential function looks like this plus an arbitrary constant because we're on a connected set. We just need one, so we use this. So yes, our vector field is conservative, and yeah, we can apply the fundamental theorem of line integrals to calculate the line integral that we had. So instead of using the definition and parameterizing three different paths and calculating three different line integrals, we just go, oh yeah, the, the line integral of f dot dr along c, it's just f at the final point, which was minus 3, 0, minus f at the initial point, which was 2, 0. And now you just plug those in and get whatever you get. You get minus 27, or, well, you get minus 3 cubed, so minus 27, plus 0, minus 2 cubed, plus 0, so minus 35. Uh, units, we had meters and meters and newtons, joules. This is a lot easier than using the definition of line integrals in terms of parameterized paths. But then again, this was an easy vector field to produce a potential function for. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's look at finding potential functions for something harder. So let's look at example. Take the vector field f equals e to the y plus 3x squared, x e to the y plus cosine of y, a, show that f is conservative by producing a potential function f. And b, calculate. line integral along C of f dot dr, where, actually I'm just going to draw a picture of C. We take, take the parabola, 
where y equals x squared. And let C be, oh, my scale's gonna be bad, but oh well. We're gonna go from zero, zero to one, one. Along this oriented curve C. All right, how do you produce a potential function for f? Well, in a sense, you did what you do what we did in the last problem. It's just harder. Um, so. We want, or I guess we need this time, since we're told to show it's conservative, we need f so that f, the vector field, f equals the gradient vector field of the function little f. This means we need e to the y plus 3x squared, comma, x e to the y plus the cosine of y, to equal the gradient vector field of little f. So to equal this. So again, we get two simultaneous, two equations that we need to solve simultaneously. We need the partial derivative of f with respect to x to be e to the y plus 3x squared. And at the same time, we need the partial derivative of f with respect to y to be x e to the y plus cosine of y. Alrighty. So what do you do? You anti-differentiate. Right? This says that f has to be an antiderivative of this. But I said this a long time ago. Nobody calls this a partial antiderivative, and nobody writes the round d there, but really it would be nice if, if that were the tradition, because you are undoing partial differentiation with respect to x. So you perform this integral with respect to x, assuming y is a constant. And so what you get out of here is this is just a constant integrated with respect to x. You get x times e to the y plus x cubed. And then, I hope you remember, we're, we're taking partial anti-differentiation with respect to x. Normally, in one variable calculus, you'd have a plus c here. But that plus an arbitrary constant is now plus an arbitrary function of y. Because we're undoing partial differentiation with respect to x. Anything that just depends on y, if you take its partial derivative with respect to x, will vanish. So you can have an arbitrary function of y here. And in fact, you need to include that because it, well, in general, you need to include it because you might need to pick an a of y that's not zero or not a constant to make this condition true at the same time. You might think that what you do at this point is, oh, anti-differentiate this one with respect to y, and then try to make the two f's match somehow. That is not what you want to do. Um, you want to instead take what you know f already looks like, take its partial derivative with respect to y required to equal this and see what it tells you about a of y. So you take the partial derivative of this with respect to y. You get x e to the y. Partial derivative of this with respect to y is 0. Partial derivative of this with respect to y is just its ordinary derivative. So we, it's typical, to, it's usual to switch to the prime notation. That's the partial derivative of this with respect to y. And you require it to equal this. That. You'll notice the x e to the y's cancel, and you get a prime of y equals cosine of y. If our vector field were not conservative, this is where you'd see it. You would get a prime of y equals, and not all the x's would cancel out. You'd get something that depends on x, but a of y is not allowed to. So if our vector field were not conservative, this would be the first place you'd see it. Maybe you get a prime of y equals cosine of y plus x then there's no way for you to do this and your vector field would not be conservative. But we just got a prime of y as a function of y. 
This means a of y, you anti-differentiate from single variable calculus, is sine of y plus some constant, which again I can't call c because that's what my curve is called, so go with a of y plus k. And now we're done because we already knew that f looked like this, except we didn't know what a of y was. Well, now we know. The plus k is not really important because I mean, it is and it isn't. If you're trying to find the most general, what every potential function looks like, of course it's important. But we already know they all differ by constants. Um, so every potential function looks like this. If you're using this to calculate line integrals, though, you might as well drop the of at k, because you're going to evaluate at one point, subtract the value at another point. The k's will cancel. Um, all right. So. How do you do part B now? Well, hopefully you realized, <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost a joke. If, if you're asked to do this in part A, giving you a specific path in part B is just to see if you're, you know, to see if you've caught on to the fundamental theorem of line integrals yet. We don't care what curve we're integrating along. The, the fundamental theorem of line integrals says that once you know that f is a conservative vector field and you have a potential function, to calculate this, you just calculate f at your final point, 1, 1, and subtract what you get at your initial point, 0, 0. The f that we just produced, let me write it where it's more convenient, the f that we just produced was x e to the y plus x cubed plus the sine of y. I'm not going to put the plus k because we just need a potential function to calculate this, not the most general one. You evaluate at 1, 1. What do you get at 1, 1? Uh, e plus 1 plus the sine of 1. What's the sine of 1? <laughs> Nothing special. Minus what you get at 0, which is 0, 0, 0. So minus 0. So yeah, we get e plus 1 plus the sine of 1. All right. That's an example where we had to produce a potential function. But if you, if you look at it, Suppose you weren't told ahead of time that your vector field was a conservative vector field, so you didn't know if there exists a potential function. And you want, you want to see if there is a potential function, if there is, find one. Well, it's a little time consuming to go through this process and see that it would first fail over here, and you'd find that a prime of y equals something that depends on x. It takes a, you know, a little too much time to do that. If we had a nice way of checking that we were going to succeed before we actually try, that would be nice. Now, it may seem hard to believe that you can decide if there is such a little f without trying to produce one, but you can. Um, so I want to tell you how that goes. So. What we're trying to do here, I'll say it again, if you knew your vector field was a, was a conservative vector field and you want a potential function, you just do what we did and you solve those simultaneous differential equations. But if you don't know and you're trying to decide if your vector field is a potential vector field, You'd rather check quickly that you're going to succeed if you go through the long process or know that you won't so that you won't even bother trying. So suppose we've got a vector field. And right now I'm going to look at a vector field on an open subset of R2. Suppose you've got this. So you have a vector field and call the component functions P and Q. Then if if f is the gradient vector field of some little f, well, that means it equals the partial derivative of f with respect to x, common partial derivative f with respect to y. And um, then what we need is we need the partial of f with respect to x to be p and the partial of f with respect to y to be q. How could we possibly decide ahead of time whether there is such an f? 
Well, remember, remember our theorem about mixed partial derivatives. Assuming that f has continuous second partial derivatives, then from this, if we take the partial derivative of both sides with respect to y, you would get the second partial derivative of f with respect to first x and then y has to be the partial derivative of p with respect to y. On the other hand, you can get this same mixed partial but in the other order, but we know those are equal if f is, has continuous second partial derivatives if you hit both sides of this with the partial derivative with respect to x. So you take the partial derivative with respect to x of both sides of this And then you get that the second partial derivative of f with respect to x, and, or with respect to y and then x, should be the partial derivative of q with respect to x. But these, for, you know, in all the examples we'll look at, where we have nice functions with continuous partial derivatives of all orders, these two mixed partials, the ones in opposite orders, these have to be the same. Which means the partial derivative of p with respect to y has to equal the partial derivative of q with respect to x. So if f equals pq is conservative, then, all right, it looks kind of backwards and don't get lost. Right? To be conservative, yeah, we need a potential function so that this is the partial derivative with respect to x of the potential function. This is the partial derivative with respect to y of the potential function. But to check whether there is a potential function, you check the opposite partial derivatives, right? We need this, but what, then what we hit this with to get the mixed partial was the other partial derivative, the one with respect to y. You need the partial derivative of p with respect to y to equal the partial derivative of q with respect to x. It looks like it's backwards from what we were checking a minute ago. It's not. Um, if you think about how you're getting it, it makes perfect sense. You want this to be true, which means to get this second partial, you take the partial derivative with respect to y. Um, so you take the partial derivative with respect to kind of the wrong variable with respect to y of this function and see if it equals the partial derivative with respect to x of that function. If that is not true, then the vector field is not conservative. But is it an if and only if? Yeah. If capital F is conservative, this has to be true. If this is true, does F have to be conservative? And the answer is yes. If you assume one more, one extra thing. We were already assuming we were doing this on a connected open set a long time ago in the first chapter we defined and our open set U that I was talking about at the beginning, and U is simply connected. Then F is conservative. I remind you what well, simply connected intuitively for a region in R2, so in the xy plane, means there aren't any holes in the region. That's how you think of it. Um, so if your region is in one piece and it doesn't have any holes in it, then and these partial derivatives in the, of your components of the vector field are equal, then the vector field is conservative. So then it's an if and only if. But if your region were to have some holes in it, there. There are examples, and some in the book, of, of, of um, vector fields that satisfy this, even though they're not conservative. All right. Um, there's another way of phrasing this that extends nicely to, um, to three dimensions. So let me go ahead and say that. It's, it's much harder. Oh, this is hard. Um, but the three-dimensional case is, suppose f 
f. Uh, let me stop. Stop for a second. Let me rewrite this in a different way before I state this. This condition is the same as saying the partial derivative of q with respect to x minus the partial derivative of p with respect to y equals 0. You may recall, this is called the two-dimensional curl. Where the, the two-dimensional curl of f. And so what, what we're saying is that if the curl is 0 and you're on a simply connected region, then f is conservative. So that's true if f is a, a function on R3. So suppose you've got f, uh, a vector field on R3. f is a continuous vector field. Uh, it needs to be actually differentiable, continuously differentiable. Vector field. on a connected open set. A connected open subset U in R3. All right, what's, what am I about to state? The theorem is, um, the theorem is if F is conservative, then the curl is 0. So that's just like this. This is saying that two-dimensional curl is 0. And then there's this converse provided if u is simply connected, and the curl of f zero, then f is conservative. But to be honest, we, we kind of like this the most in the two-dimensional case where it's so easy to check that the curl is zero. Checking that the, the three-dimensional curl is zero, I mean, what we're trying to avoid is the extra work of trying to produce a potential function and failing at some point. And yeah, calculating the curl is not, the three-dimensional curl isn't so bad, but it's also not that trivial. We really like this in the two-dimensional case. Um, so as a quick, 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 quick example. Example. F equals x minus y squared, comma, minus x squared. So let me call this P PQ. Is not conservative. You might as well not spend any time looking for a potential function. Because there's not one. Um, how do you show it's not conservative? You do what we just said. You calculate the backwards partial derivatives. You calculate the partial of p, the partial of the first component with respect to y, and you calculate the partial of the second component with respect to x, and you see that they're not equal. Right? The partial of p with respect to y is minus 2y. The partial of q with respect to x is minus 2x minus 2x does not equal minus 2y today. Those are unequal, so it's not conservative. Right? This test for conservative vector fields is very fast. You'd much rather do this than see that you fail at producing a potential function. All right, there's 
there's um, one last physics-y thing that I should do. Um, it's, you really shouldn't talk about conservative vector fields and potential functions without doing this. So, suppose now that we have a conservative vector field. These do come up in physics fairly regularly. So, suppose F is a conservative vector field on a connected open subset of our end. All right, so there exists a potential function. So And we know that all the f's differ by a constant. Um, what I want to do is define um, the potential energy associated with the conservative vector field. So I'm now going to assume this really is a conservative vector. First of all, it should have said field. And a conservative, I'm going to say a conservative force field. And I'm going to assume that the the x, y, and z, well, all the, the position coordinates are actually measuring position. Um, then what are the units on little f? Um, the units on little f would be energy units. Um, right there, you take the, the partial derivative of this with respect, to the partial derivatives of this to get f, or integrate this with respect to distance and position to get little f. So if f is a force field and you're using position variables, then the potential function has energy units. And what we'd like to do is define the potential energy of the force field but as the value of the potential function. But there are a couple of things that are problematic here. First of all, there are an infinite number of potential functions f. They all differ by a constant, but still they're an infinite number. Um, and secondly, this is, physicists do not call these potential functions. <laughs> so, um, to fix the, the constant value problem, uh, what we do is, for some f, then you pick, let p be a point in you and choose F so that F at P is zero. This is what physicists like to do. You want to select one of the potential functions. Uh, you want to fix the value of the constant. And so typically what they do is they pick a point where they want to assign the, the potential energy zero, and then that fixes what the constant is or can be. Sometimes there's a mild change in the definition. Sometimes they'll say, I want the potential energy to be zero at infinity, and that will involve limits. But let's just deal with this case. Let P be a point in U and choose F so that then, negative f of x is the potential energy of, of the vector field f at x. This is normalized the word normal is used too much, but still, normalized so that f of p equals zero.
Notice this minus sign. Um, in fact, physicists change, put that minus sign in what they call a potential function. For them, a potential function, little f, for the vector field f, is a function little f so that capital F equals negative the gradient vector of little f. Um, mathematicians typically don't do that. We define, we define potential functions the way we have. But then that doesn't agree with the physicist's notion then of potential energy unless you insert the minus sign here at the end. So, um, all right, let's look at a classic example and then we'll be done. So, let's look at potential energy associated with gravity. So, gravitational the gravitational force field near the surface of the Earth. So we kind of assume that the Earth doesn't curve nearby, so the gravitational force field near the surface of the Earth is, well, I should say approximately, but this is what's used over and over again, is approximately you should know the force of gravity, the magnitude of the force, is your mass times the acceleration of gravity, m times g, so uh, mass times the gravitational acceleration. But the direction is straight down. So that's in the z direction, but in the negative z direction. So it means the force field is 0, 0, minus mg. Right? Or if you prefer, this is minus mg, the, ve the vector k. All right, is this, for us to talk about potential energy of this vector field, this has to be a conservative vector field. You don't talk about this for other kinds of, you don't talk about potential energy for non-conservative vector fields. So, um, is this a conservative vector field. Well, we don't need to check that the curl is zero. There's a clear, <laughs> there's a clear F that would give us this, minus mgz. Right? If you take little f to be minus mgz, its partial derivative with respect to x is zero, its partial derivative with respect to y is zero, and its partial derivative with respect to z is this. So yes, um, this is a conservative vector field, and what every potential function looks like is this. So yes, this vector field is the gradient vector field, so is a conservative vector field. And all the potential functions for it look like this. Okay, so what is usually done? Well, what's usually done is we just assign the potential energy of an object on the ground to be zero. So uh, z here, z here is measured, yeah, z is measuring distance above the ground. So um, we usually set the potential energy to be zero when you're on the ground. So we can pick any point on the ground, it's where z is zero. So when z is zero, we want, we get to make this choice, we want f is zero. We want the potential energy to be zero so that, uh, of course the potential energy is really negative that, but negative zero is zero. So anyway, we want this to be zero. So this means we need zero to be, we need this to be zero when z is zero to be zero plus c. Oh, so we pick c equals zero. And so the f that we need is minus mgz, but that means the potential energy is negative that. So let me write it up here. The potential energy is negative that, so it's positive mgz. z is your height above the Earth, and that's usually denoted by an h. And you're probably familiar with this if you've had any physics, that the potential energy of an object in the gravitational field near the surface of the Earth is just mgh. 
the, the mass times acceleration of gravity times the height above the Earth. And yeah, it's because of this. That's if there's a conservative vector field, this is a potential function for it. We get to set the potential equal to zero pretty much wherever we want. We pick zero on the ground, and then that leaves us with no other choices. Uh, the potential energy everywhere then is MGH. All right, that was conservative vector fields. Um, in the later sections, we're going to look at more, more um, difficult things, uh, more difficult concepts involving vector fields and integration. So I hope you uh, look at this and think it's not too bad because it's going to get worse. <laughs>